This is Modern Mindset, the show where we discuss the psychology and emotions of finance and business. I'm your host, Adam Cox, and joining me today is Tim Watton, who is a communications expert, an author, and a public speaker. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Adam. It's great to be here. And uh, Tim, you're a uh, an author, an award-winning author, I believe. Give us a bit of a, a background on who you are and, and, and what your book's about. Sure will. Um, my memoir actually has a very provocative title and the title is How Have I Cheated Death? The reason why it's called that is because um, I'm 46 now and every single day of my life I have battled with the incurable incurable, um, illness called cystic fibrosis and diabetes. Now cystic fibrosis is a life-limiting condition. At 17 I was expected to be dead so from I was diagnosed at birth, um, and the prognosis was that I wouldn't live beyond 17. So to get to my late mid to late 40s, how have I cheated death is exactly how I feel about why I'm still here um, and the amazing abilities to actually endure what cannot be cured every day. Mm. And um, the reason why you know I was very interested in having this kind of interview with today is because we actually had an interview about two, two, three years ago, and some of the, the 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 topics that we covered then, still I think about them again and again and again, you know. And I don't have you know any of these kind of incurable diseases, but you know I run businesses and and, and I have quite a busy life. Uh, but some of the things that I kind of took from our our previous chat really kind of stayed with me. So I thought it's definitely worth getting you you in uh, the studio today just to have a bit of a chat and see how your, you know, how the lessons that you've learned through your condition don't just apply to someone with your condition, you know, cystic fibrosis, um, but can apply to anyone, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and time and again, I hear people on um, both in daily com- conversations or radio, TV, who say that they've just had some epiphany because they had good health and then they were knocked down with poor health. Brian Moore, the rugby player, uh, was one. I only heard him um, recently on Saturday Live Radio sharing that he understood that life is short before but actually only had a sort of um, an abstract idea about the fact that that was a reality. He had a heart attack at the end of last year and suddenly um, he has a richer um, perspective on life knows that um, he won't always be around, and then suddenly sees the minutia of life in a different way. Now, I've had that lens, um, optics on life for 46 years. I've never had good health, and therefore I've always appreciated what is important to me. Um, And as I get older, I've now got a 10-year-old son and a wife. Um, that, That understanding of what is important has been magnified mm. to the point where I now have a very, um, I believe, a very um, awesome um, and fulfilling um, state of mind every day that I live every single day like it's my last day on earth, which to people with decent health feels sort of quite down and negative and macabre, but actually it's actually extremely liberating and empowering to feel what can I achieve every single day not assuming that tomorrow is going to come. Mm. And I had heard of CF before we, we met the first time, but wasn't didn't really understand what it is and, and kind of how it actually affects an individual. Would you be able to elaborate on, on your condition for those people that haven't really heard too much about it? Okay, thank you. I will do. Um, it's a genetic illness. My mum and dad were carriers without realising. Then their children have a one in four chance um, of having the illness. Um, it affects the lungs um, and it affects the pancreas um, and the digestion. So um, we are troubled with infection in the lungs and the thick mucus that it st- struggles to breathe with. A cough, a constant cough, is a very common symptom of cystic fibrosis. It is a killer. I won't disabuse you of the notion, Adam, that people die early. They still do. The average age uh, of survival is only 40, whereas it was 17 when I was born. Um, so it's going in the right direction, but people still die early. Um, if one's lungs get full of too much infection, then the next thing is that they need oxygen to breathe. And after that, if they can be lucky enough, then a lung transplant is their last chance before, sadly, death. And 
I've lost hundreds of friends across the 40 years to this illness, which is heartbreaking, and each time they, they die, it reminds me again of my mortality, of which I never lose sight of, but it's just a harsher reminder. Um, there are 10,500 people in the UK that have cystic fibrosis, um, and most people have probably heard of, you know, it's similar to asthma. What the, most people don't appreciate that two things. Um, one is just how severe it is that people die. And secondly, that there is no remission. There's no time off or day off with CF. It's every single day there's a regime of two to three hours of 40 tablets, different tablets throughout the day. There's injections, there's uh, physiotherapy, nebulizers, inhalers throughout the day but um, as I know you liked my mindset was always not to be defined by those two hours I always felt well there's two hours for cystic fibrosis and diabetes there's that leaves Tim Watton 22 hours and that that way of framing it meant that I was always winning that battle mm. yeah, and I think I think perspective is one of those things that um, can potentially give you benefits and, and, a, and an advantage and I mean, what would you say to those people that say, Tim, this is just positive thinking? Is it, is it positive thinking? It is, but you have to work hard at that. Hmm. And um, people can start the day with positive thinking and then leave the house and then life kicks them up the backside. Hmm. Or, or a work meeting gives them bad news. Or they receive a phone call out of the blue, some domestic news is awful. And then they go back to negative thoughts. It's, it's the consistency of thought that I've learned. Mm. and the power of the mind. Um, so I have a holy trinity of survival techniques, and they are do my medication 100% flawlessly, um, regular exercise, and the third of the holy trinity is the resilient power of the mind. Mm. And that doesn't come by accident. You have to work hard at that. Negative thoughts will come in to me, and challenges will come to me in my medical survival every day, but I've learned to override those negative thoughts. Now, if they've just a seriously bad piece of news, I have what, what you, one would call wallow time, like a hippo, and you actually you do need to understand why you're feeling upset and sad, um, and that is part of mindfulness. It's mindfulness mm. isn't just the jazz hands, good moments. It's also to understand when you're not feeling good. But actually, after a while, I learn when and how quickly I need to get back to a more positive state of mind. So um, that then leads me to realize that actually all we ever have is this moment. And now people talk about being present. They may have a nice fleeting state of mind where they go, this is good, how can I have more of this? But actually they don't know where and how to form habits that give them more of those pleasurable moments. And that's what I've learned actually to really understand that not to worry about the past, not to fret overtly about the future. And the more that I enjoy the moment actually has helped me both physically with my conditions and also mentally. And, and uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of speak to a lot of people about things, hypnosis, NLP, you know, various techniques. And, and I would say mindfulness is one of those things that is very easy to be dismissive of. Um, but at the same time, it's something that, you know, when you're in that moment, you know, you're able to experience things on a different level than, you know, if you're there physically, but your head is somewhere else. And and I think a lot of people can relate to, you know, they're at work, they're thinking about the weekend, they're on the weekend, they're thinking about work, they're not truly in the moment. Yeah. From your experience of mindfulness, how do you do it? How do you make sure you're in that moment and, and you're living yeah. there as opposed to somewhere else a good analogy for people is that their mind um, is like a crazy monkey that's flying hither and thither actually you need to silence that monkey and i'd like encourage people to think of being present as growing roots grow roots in the moment whether it be a view whether it's appreciating your child whether it's appreciating um, a moment with your partner or a film and actually just switch that mind off. Mm. If me negative or thoughts come in about planning the future or worrying about the past, turn them off and just hone in and drink. I call, talk about drinking the moment. If there's a landscape, I listen to birdsong. That stops me thinking about my, my thoughts. 
So it's honing in on something that allows you to be focused and growing those roots in the moment. And I've had some thoughts recently that some of the things that we really enjoy as humans, you know, partying with friends, um, watching a sporting event, actually our mind stops wondering about because we're really focused in on the moment. Mm. So you're looking to have more of those, um, those moments where actually the brain and the mind is switched off. Because at that point, you actually appreciate that, that all you ever have is this moment and how powerful it is. Yeah, I think it's a really, a really kind of powerful point. And, you know, after, after kind of our, our last interview, I kind of reflected on that. And it was kind of, what are these things that I naturally sought out but didn't really understand why I did? And, and one of the things I used to do a, a lot of was a Brazilian martial art called capoeira. And, and it's one of these things that if your head is anywhere else other than in that circle of, of people, you're going to get, you know, a, a foot to the head. You're going you're gonna to get knocked out. Um, but, I, but I think the reason why I was kind of drawn to it was because it is in, in that moment. You can't, you can't be anywhere else. Um, your perspective on time, I think, is, is kind of fascinating. Um, when you were younger, let's say, you know, childhood years, teenage years, is there any kind of techniques that you use to kind of make the most? Because as you, as you said back then, you know, the predict, predicted lifespan with someone with your condition was much, much younger than it is now. Yeah. What's the things that you did to really maximize your, your youth, your teenage years? I think when you're younger, you, you have a, a more infantile view in life. Uh, and even though I knew the clock was ticking, I didn't take it overtly seriously. I lived just as most children do for the moment of play. Um, I think it's more as an adult and the more that I've witnessed, the more that I've realised that actually with my friends dying of my condition, that actually it is very serious. Uh, there are banana skins around every corner for my conditions. And actually um, over 50% of people with my illness have chronic depression. Now, the survival opportunity is there that every morning I go into my metaphoric wardrobe and I can pull out two t-shirts. One t-shirt says victim and the other t-shirt says survivor. I decide each morning which t-shirt I'm going to put on. Mm. Now I do know and I'm not going to um, be judgmental but I know a lot of people who understandably put the victim t-shirt on who actually, not just people with a condition, but just generally people out there I've met and worked with. They want everyone to know why their life's harsh and they won't, uh, that's what they they will define themselves by. Mm. But actually I've made the mental choice to actually put on the survivor t-shirt, not to be the victim. And by doing that, actually, I use my time effectively every day. People talk about having a to-do list. I've gone one layer beyond that. And I have a no feel do list every single day. What do I want to know? I'm a very curious person. What do I want to feel? I want to feel emotion. I want to feel happy. I want to help some other people. I want to reach out to a friend I've not spoken to in a while. And lastly, what will I do with my day? Um, how will I do my job well? How will I impact my, my family? How will I help others? What random stranger, what, what act can I do for them? Because if tomorrow doesn't come, what can you do today that you can then close out the day and go, that was as good as it could have been? Mm. A lot of people, if you pose the hypothetical question, you've got 24 hours left, what do you do? And, and you use that phrase, living each day like it's your last. I think a lot of people wouldn't go to work. Um, they're not going to pay any bills. They're not going to worry about those kind of things. They're going to be quite hedonistic. Um, to what extent is the temptation to almost kind of get out of balance with you, with that kind of scarcity of time mindset, is there the temptation to say, well, screw work, let's just enjoy yeah, life? I, I, Adam, I think there was before in my 20s, probably when work was more part-time or my health wasn't as good. Um and there wasn't certain medication that's available now that's helped me, um, you, you tend to be a bit manana and just go, well, what the hell? Mm. I'll live um, literally for the moment and screw everyone else. But now, even though I hope that tomorrow comes, I now have a family to support, a young son that I want to be around for. I'm now, I played lots of hockey. I was an England hockey player. So I'm still very active. I talk about exercise regularly. So hockey is one of those bits but going to the gym 
But actually this means that, yes, there is a day and I want to have that no feel do list. But actually I know and hope ex and I really expect for tomorrow to come. So there's a balance I find mm. that I seek out those moments. I mean, there are some days that are just horribly mundane and moribund at work. But actually I'll make sure that every day is punctuated by a nice, at least one nice moment. Now that could be just going out and seeing the sunset. And drain and doing some deep breaths, not breaths from the chest, actually from deep, deep breaths, and actually really suck up that moment, drink that moment, or actually making sure that I have a hug with my son, making sure that I leave work on time to have that, because that can often be the day that can be from good to great. Mm. I think it's really interesting. And is there any tools or kind of because you you come across very self aware? Um, is there any ways that you um, detect if your life is out of balance to then get it back on track because I think it's it's possible for anyone to kind of maybe there's an opportunity at work or or maybe you know something happens to kind of get into that habit of spending a bit too much time in some of the areas which create that imbalance yes I think you need to um, like a body whisperer to understand when you're maybe worrying about stuff that you cannot influence or stuff that actually is small. Um, I think inherently most people, the listeners will know experiences where they fretted about an event or a potential happening that actually never came to fruition. Mm. And they spent far too long, maybe got hypertension, got really stressed, anxious, talked about it for far too long. Whereas again, if I just go back to the understand, all you ever have is this moment um, and square off what you cannot influence. And I think I've learned a lot about that. And that's been taught to me because if I didn't do that with my health, I would struggle. Now, I now have an abundance of resilience that when events happen to me outside of my health, whether it be at work or socially, um, I actually have um, an infinitely um, better way to square off quickly what to worry about and what not to. Mm. So I think that's what, it, what it's given me. So I've actually had, I've learned the power of the mind that actually is often underplayed by lots of people. I see realms of people in the business place who fret and worry and spend far too long, probably work longer hours, trying to find a solution for something that they don't even need to the next day because it, it actually was just unlikely to happen. Mm. That's what I've learned. Actually, don't sweat the small stuff. I think it's uh, very good advice. Easier said, to d easier said than done. Agreed. But actually, people... They just need to remember how much of what they fretted about ever came to fruition, and I imagine it's minuscule. Mm. That is, is very, very kind of sage advice. There's there. also, um, I would, I'm going to give people a gift today, um, and the gift is a saying. Um, it, it can, to those that have had maybe a, a relatively healthy life, sound a bit fluffy, but it's this. And when en whenever a difficult moment comes, and that could be as you walk towards a meeting with a very tricky um, client, or winning, want to win new business, just say to yourself, everything is always working out for me. That sentence I use 20 times a day. It could be that I'm having a difficult time with my health. You know, at four o'clock in the morning when you're having a coughing fit, which is a normal symptom of cystic fibrosis, I'll say that to get override the horrific feeling I'm having. Mm. Likewise, if I go into the office um, tr trying to win new business or um, working with a, a new client, I'll just say before the meeting, everything is always working out for me to myself and it sometimes just repeat it. And trust me, you're almost setting out the outcome you want rather than going, oh my gosh, how will this go? Maybe they won't like me. I won't win the business. I'm, I'm, that's, you're worrying about the future. The present moment is Everything is always working out for me. It's grounded. You're growing those roots in that saying. And it's present tense. It's kind of a bit of a law of attraction. You're kind yeah. of um, You're, pre yeah. preempting uh, exactly. an outcome that you want. This um, obviously is a, is a show about the, the psychology and emotions of, of business and finance. With a, a, a potentially life-limiting condition, and, and you'll be aware of the mortality rates more than anyone else, um, does it change how you think about the, the things that we're, we're kind of almost trained to think a lot about, things like saving, investment, retirement, how, how do you look at that from your specific perspective? 
Yes, I think um, it's only in my 20s before I, I became a father. Um, I wasn't saving as I should have done. I, I certainly know 20-year-olds that were planning their picket fence and 2.4 children before I ever imagined I could have. Because if you're not expecting to get to 30, you're not. I wasn't expecting pensions. I wasn't expecting a house, a mortgage, family. Mm. But actually, when I got near 30 and I was still relatively well, I actually thought here there could be a different outcome here for Tim Watton. And then I married Katie. And when you then come together as a partnership, you realize um, there's more to live for. It gave me extra motivation. Um, I then not only had a company pension, but also started um, an old mutual wealth pension, which is still going. I started an ISA that's actually well funded. Um, and Katie and I, my wife, speak a lot about our finances and we put aside money for Felix, ready for a rainy day and for further education. So that motivation is there. Wanting that, it's a dual motivation, Adam, because I want to keep as well as possible so that I'm as available and can work, but also that actually my, the future of both my wife and son are looked after as, as long as I'm around to be able to do so. So yes, I do look out for my finances. I, but I also live in the moment and enjoy, Katie and I enjoy life together. We punctuate our marriage with the odd evening out or trip up to London to make it actually feel that we're able to enjoy it. Mm. I think if you're always saving, 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 that rainy day and you wonder whether it will ever come, again, it's, it's being present. It, it cuts across all facets of your life. You know, we are present as a couple when we have that lunch and dinner. And maybe we don't always talk about um, being parents. We actually remember what it's like to be husband and wife, mm. you know. But also I have a great time with my son. I'm his hockey coach now. And so I coach his team on a Sunday. But going back to the finance and planning, yes, we both plan financially for all our futures with the hope that I'm going to be there long term. But actually we've saved enough that actually should tomorrow not happen for me. Um, Felix and Katie will be looked after. I th I th yeah, very because th that's the bit I was trying to reconcile. It's kind of how do you live for today? And because these hedonistic people that literally live each day as it comes, they're not thinking about pensions. They're not thinking about investments. They're not thinking about you know buying property and things like that. So that's a really interesting. But but Adam, it doesn't need to be. Um, people talk about bucket list, bucket bucket list moments. I don't have a bucket list. It's like a non written down bucket list. I can have a memory that costs me nothing that actually is more enduring than something that's cost quite a few thousand or they've had to go to a particular island and do some amazing act that actually is over in seconds often. Mm. And then they're looking for the next thing. You know, and I can get a nice view holding hands with my wife that's cost me nothing, that feels just as powerful as something that's over in seconds. And um, people then wonder, well... Gosh, that feels a bit empty again. What's the next big thing? I think it's that that phrase, isn't it? There's some people that know the the cost of everything, the value of nothing, you know. And yeah. and value can come from your right experiences and emotional sensations and and yeah. as you say, soaking. Them and up. the the Roman philosopher Seneca, many thousands of years ago, says, "To be everywhere is to be nowhere." Mm. So actually, there are moments that you can actually be present without having to try and be. Um, have some glorious event going on. There it is, there it is. Question I had with um, a lot of business people that I know and, and people that are very successful, they procrastinate a lot. They, they, I mean, they've, they've achieved a lot of success, but they do procrastinate. Your unique um, perspective that comes from your condition, be honest, you procrastinate as well, don't you? Um, I've, I've learned to try and take that out of my life mm. because um, I'm pretty good at being um, giving myself context. E e come on, even your tax return, you must have put that off. Oh, yeah, I mean, there are certain things. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not, uh, there's no utopia for me. Um, and um, there is a lot of proof that actually if you get the most important um, bit of work out the way first thing in the morning, the rest of your day flows. Um, and I'm not always able to achieve that. And you go for the low-hanging fruit that's easy to achieve. Mm. So maybe that is a form of procrastination. 
But when it comes to forming the habits around my health survival, I don't procrastinate, I do the meds. Um, if it comes to making uh, an informed decision on a new bit of work um, or a life decision, actually, innately, I always say to myself, what will I be more annoyed with myself if I do or don't do this? And by asking myself that question, self-reflection actually is very important and stops that manana approach to being procrastinator. I certainly wouldn't be alive if I procrastinated because I would always be wondering, oh, I can put off doing the meds, but actually I am, I have a strong discipline. And I think I then have taken that into the rest of my life. My wife may not tell you that I, I'm quite so good <laughs> in, on the home front, but on the whole, I think it's made me um, be a lot more diligent and uh, a lot more vibrant in the actions I do take. That's great. And remind us again of your, of your book uh, and, and where someone could get that from. Yeah, um, will do. Um, it is called How Have I Cheated Death? Um, my name is Tim um, Watton, um, and people can order it in all good bookstores in the UK. Um, you could um, order it from the likes of Waterstones and Foils. Uh, they have the, uh, the number and they can find it. And also it can be bought uh, online on Amazon. And and if someone, let's say, didn't have the time to, to fully read the book, what would be... For someone that doesn't have a condition like CF, what, what, what's the number one takeaway you feel that they could get from reading that book that could change their life? I think the evidence I've had, whether you have perfectly healthy, um, you're perfectly healthy, or you do have any form of chronic condition or a new diagnosis, actually that will give you uh, an opportunity to understand that there is hope, that the outcome that the doctor may be telling you it doesn't always have to be that way. And one of the key things I've learned in life is that um, just because I've suffered all my life with these medical conditions, I've learned that no one has a charm life. Everybody has a cross to bear. And I think my book really tries to give that, give that perspective to people. That, that life, the, the, the sands in the hourglass are coming out quickly. How are you gonna live the moment? How are you gonna be present? and how you're going to maximise the days that you have while you've still got them. Uh, Tim, again, a fascinating conversation, and uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thanks for joining me on Modern Mindset. In association with Share Radio, join me again next week for more.